to start us off. Thank you, Emerson. And thanks very much to ODI for hosting this debate, which I think is on one of the most important issues in the run-up to, to Busan. Uh, I'm going to start by laying out as a proposition that we are really measuring results in the wrong way in countries that are affected by conflict, violence and fragility. And I'll use a story about timor leste to illustrate that. Um, timor, which was the first new country of the 21st century when it gained independence in 2002, did very well for the first three or four years after independence, but then had a renewed bout of violence in 2005 and 2006. And at the time that its renewed civil conflict occurred, it was in the process of trying to negotiate access to the Millennium Challenge account. Uh, the MCC obviously being one of the aid vehicles, which measures results in a roughly traditional way, measures results on governance, on poverty reduction, etc. So after the violence and after uh, political stability and progress were restored, Timor went back to try to negotiate access and was told that although in the 18 months since the violence occurred, they had resettled the one quarter of their population that had been displaced during the violence and provided them with reintegration assistance. They had managed to prevent the violence from continuing or reigniting or hurting other sections of the population. They had held a constitutional amendment process and an election successfully without violence during that period. But despite those achievements, they were told that they had not made progress on the indicators that the MCC actually measures, because none of those three areas is included in the results indicators that the MCC looks at. Uh, and in fact, they were told that there were criticisms that some of the ways in which they had provided reintegration assistance were vulnerable perhaps to corruption or could be seen to have had some wastage involved. So you had a real contrast between a country where they felt that they had actually done the maximum possible in that period to recover from a very, very difficult bout of violence, and yet one of the major aid organizations, and I have to say reflected by others, felt that on their metric of measurement, they had not done anything, and if anything, they might have slightly slid backwards. And that contrast is very, very frequent when we look at countries that are affected by conflict. I think it occurs for two reasons. Uh, and I'm going to call this the accidental dilemma and the deliberate dilemma. The accidental dilemma is that none of our mainstream global indicators focus on security, justice, or basic employment. Some of the things that are most important for fragile states trying to recover, and indeed the main message of the World Development Report, which is that uh, building confidence in security, justice, and jobs is crucial to recovery. But the Millennium Development Goals don't contain any reference to security and justice. Now, to a large extent, I think it's fair to call this an accidental dilemma because at the time that they were being developed, the dialogue around fragility and countries that were recovering from violence was very much less mainstream in development discussions. So I don't think this was an explicit decision that there should be absolutely no reference to those issues. I think it was more an accidental development at the time. But the reality still remains that for countries that are making great progress in reducing violence, which after all is one of the most fundamental things for people's welfare, because if people are no longer at risk of being physically hurt or having their son or daughter disappear. That has to be a measure of welfare. But those countries have no way in the global results system to demonstrate that they're making progress. The deliberate dilemma, I think, is a, a little bit more tricky. And this is what the World Development Report calls the dual accountability dilemma, which is that taxpayers and constituents in donor countries sometimes have different expectations of what aid will deliver than the population and constituents in the countries where aid is actually spent. Um, not only do they have different expectations, they often have very different timescales. A good example of that, I think, is on progress against corruption. 
So corruption, uh, fighting corruption is very important for violence prevention. Liberia is actually one of the countries that has taken very decisive um, action on this. Um, it's important for the population of the countries concerned, and we know from looking across countries that it's important over time to prevent violence recurring. But the timings with which countries manage to bring corruption down to within controllable levels, if they are societies where corruption has been entrenched through every element of the system, are not fast. So one of the things we did in the World Development Report is we measured how long it took the fastest 20 reformers in the 20th century to go from a very high level of corruption to bringing corruption roughly under control. Um, no country, of course, has completely eliminated it. In the UK also, there are corruption scandals from, from time to time. But bringing it within reasonable limits. And roughly the timetable was between 20 and 30 years. Now, this contrasts markedly with the expectations of taxpayers or the press or the policy debate in donor countries, where people feel strongly that because corruption is a bad thing, they should see aid money being at no risk of corruption, zero tolerance, pretty much immediately. And there are expectations that in societies like uh, Congo or Afghanistan or Sudan, you can have all of your aid money spent with no risk at all of corruption within the first two or three years of a program. And this, in fact, for the countries concerned, is not realistic. It's not realistic if we look back at our own histories of development and how long it took us to eliminate corruption. So there is a problem in this dual accountability of how do you make aid answer to the expectations of taxpayers and answer to the reality on the, the ground. It's not a dilemma that's going to go away because, of course, it's desirable that aid be accountable to taxpayers. It's not a bad thing but it's something that we have to try and find a way to bridge so that what taxpayers see as results in the richer countries that finance aid and what the population see as results in the countries where aid is spent come closer together. I'll finish with just a couple of, uh, of suggestions about how we might do that. The first, I think, is to have better results indicators which reflect the priorities that come up time over time over time in countries affected by conflict. The first of those which the World Development Report proposes is to actually measure violence reduction. So this is remarkable at the moment that we don't in fact measure it globally because you would think it was a fairly basic measure of human welfare but to measure the decrease in people who are dying violent deaths, the decrease in people facing sexual violence or particular types of uh, violent attacks would be one way to enable countries to show progress, which is obviously very important to them, but could also be explained to constituencies in donor countries as progress. The second suggestion that we make is to measure trust in national institutions because we know that for sustainable violence prevention and recovery, national institutions that have a, a credible relationship with their own populations and are serving them, are not preying on them or, or abusing them, are probably the most critical thing to avoid violence and put countries back on a development path. Those are also results where things can change reasonably quickly. So, for instance, in the international operation that supported recovery in Haiti before the earthquake, but after the previous uh, round of political violence, they measured trust in the police. And the Haitian police went from being the most detested organization in Haitian society, with only two or three percent of Haitians saying that they had any trust in it, to being an institution with 60 or 70 percent of the population saying that they, they had trust in what the police were doing. So that's another indicator that we can use to show that kind of, of progress. Uh, the second area that I think we need to deliberately address in terms of results is understanding and communication between the constituencies that support aid programs within the richer countries that finance them and the results on the ground and the, the reality of what is happening on the ground. And this is hard to do because 
you're living in a very different reality. So what seems important perhaps to people living in a much more secure environment is not necessarily what may seem important when you're living in the east of Congo. But there are, I think, a couple of ways we could try to do a better job of this. One is actually to use more examples from the OECD countries and the richer countries to explain why it is that change takes time. So we actually do this very little. We don't look at areas of Britain where we had a great deal of corruption, for example. We don't look at our history of rotten electoral boroughs or widespread corruption within the police and how we, we address that and explain that some of the timetables that it took countries like us to address those problems are probably going to be similar to the timetables it will take other countries to address those problems. Um, we don't do very much direct twinning between institutions trying to address those problems in our societies and institutions trying to address them within societies affected by conflict. Again, something I think that can create less of a patronizing charity relationship and more the idea of an equal partnership in addressing problems. And we don't always do quite enough to encourage peer review by other countries which have more recently gone through similar problems to give advice on what is reasonable in terms of expectations of change. And here I'll just close by saying that the, the small group, uh, what's called the little G7 countries, which is a group of fragile states who have themselves got together to give uh, policy voice on international issues that affect fragile states, I think is a very good platform for doing this. So they recently met in, in Monrovia. This is the type of issue that they debated. And this is clearly the kind of way that you can start to develop a voice from the countries concerned of what kind of results are highest priority and what timetables are reasonable to achieve them.